So welcome everybody and thank you. Um, today's topic uh, should come as no surprise is the Open Net Initiative. Um, this is a project that uh, Rob and I have um, worked on here at the Berkman Center, but which joins four universities. Actually, it joins um, the University of Toronto, University of Cambridge, and University of Oxford. Um, there are four of us who are principal investigators. Um, uh, in addition to me here, Jonathan Zittrin, our good friend and um, uh, still a Berkman professor, um, is the uh, one leading the charge at Oxford. Um, Ron Diebert from University of Toronto uh, and Rafal Brzezinski from Cambridge. So though we are talking about results, um, perhaps as though they come from here, um, it comes from many, many uh, people working over many years. Um, and the number of researchers, several of whom are in the room, have already introduced themselves is certainly over 50 in terms of having collected the, the data set that we're talking about here. So lots of credit belongs to lots of people. Um, where we stand just briefly in the project overall, and then I'm going to turn it over to Rob to talk about results, is um, about five years ago, Jonathan Zittrin and Ben Edelman, um, who was a, a student fellow at the time, started doing some crazy things like long distance phone calls into China to determine what somebody could see if you were a um, surfing the web there, uh, and wrote the first substantial report on um, uh, the Great Firewall of China, as it's come to be known. Um, also did a similar uh, study in Saudi Arabia, and uh, other researchers at the same time were, were discovering the same story. And it probably was a small handful of states that were doing technical filtering back then, 2001, 2002. Um, and what we're here to talk about today is what's happened over the last five years, and to um, give a preview of the first ever study of uh, 40 countries and um, to uh, suggest what some of these data show. Come in, Oliver. Um, uh, and uh, to lay out at least some of the fault lines that we think um, are emerging in trends. We are not officially re releasing the results today. We'll do that um, in May at an event in Oxford with our colleagues. So we can't give you the full story exactly today. So it's sort of a preview. Um, uh, and there will be a book um, coming out from MIT Press later in the fall that we'll have the full, full story. Um, so that's when it will all come out. But we'd love to kind of um, get some reactions from you uh, at this stage. Um, in terms of the overall framing, why we care about this and why we study it, um, uh, Yokai Benkler has written this um, quite extraordinary book that I think everybody here knows, The Wealth of Networks. Um, I'm teaching the last class of the term. Drew and others have um, uh, coming to it today uh, in a class on internet and politics. And we're, um, reading uh, the chapter in Yokai's book that's the battle over the institutional ecology of the digital environment. Um, and to me, in many ways, this story of the Open Net Initiative is one of those battles over the institutional ecology um, of internet. And one of, I think, the most poignant, both in terms of how different states are seeking to control the information environment um, and how they're reacting to the changes in the way that politics and democracy are being carried out um, or affected through uh, internet, um, but also the extent to which these states have um, have to rely on others, intermediaries, individuals, um, to carry out this, this filtering and the extent to which they can't do it alone. Um, and it is in that um, broader sense um, the way that this battle is playing out. Um, should we push ahead here? Let's push ahead, yeah. Uh, so the Open Net Initiative, here's our new logo, which a group of, um, we put out a logo contest. This is the winner. This is an um, exciting finding of hundreds of people have given us logos. Um, uh, so we're delighted to show you for the first time the logo. Um, in terms of the, that it's replacing that eye that you see up there, which um, wasn't so good as a logo. Um, uh, the, the overall uh, message of those 40, um, from, from studying 40 states and how they, um, they filter the internet is that uh, we found a little over two dozen of them actually do technical internet filtering. So kind of trend number one is to say from Saudi and, um, and China five years ago, maybe Iran was filtering then, maybe Thailand, um, there are now uh, at least two dozen uh, states. The primary places where that filtering is happening um, are three regions of the world, not exclusively, but primarily. Middle East and North Africa, which has the largest number of places that do technical filtering. Um, East Asia with China sort of as the hub, obviously. Um, and then parts of Central Asia, um, uh, the former Soviet states. Um, there are other places, outliers from that story, that do a few in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'll talk in a minute about the early results from uh, election monitoring in Nigeria that we just did in the past week. Um, uh, but uh, those are the key places. And in each of those regions of the world, there are anchors, as you'd imagine, places that do the most of the filtering. China um, in East Asia, Iran, um, Saudi Arabia, and Tunisia, perhaps if you go from the Gulf to um, North Africa, and um, uh, Uzbekistan in, in Central Asia. Um, 
as you mentioned, we're putting it out in a book form, which you um, see up here, but that's uh, boring. Uh, and here's a, a question to leave you with as we go through the results, which is, um, this is the website that we're about to roll out, um, the new uh, home of the Open Net Initiative and our, and our results. Um, what we'll have up here is, um, most importantly and differently, a much more, hopefully, transparent um, showing of, of what we found, but also a welcoming to all of you and to others. And here's what I'd love to leave you with as we go through it, which is, how can we make the Open Net Initiative as a research project something that is um, able to capture more of what we're actually studying, the sort of wisdom of the crowds? We would love to figure out how to get you or others involved. How can we be much quicker and more responsive in our testing um, and inclusive, um, and then also make the data more relevant in policy settings um, to decision makers and so forth? Um, one of the things that we're uh, trying to do is to get people to suggest sites that they want us to test when we next, next go into these areas. That's a simple thing. Another is to be able to search on a um, URL and see where it's blocked in the world, um, testing against the, um, the data set and so forth. Um, and we'd love to come back to that question um, and get some thoughts from you as to how we can do that better than we have before. Dr. Okay. Ferris. Thank you, sir. I'm going to take you on a, uh, a, a quirky, eclectic, selective tour of internet filtering around the world. Uh, I wanted to start off by putting up a taxonomy of internet content restriction strategies. Uh, the point being that filtering is only one of many ways in which you can limit access to information online. This list is somewhat different every time I do it, and I'm not sure this is the right one or not, but uh, where, where a website is clearly illegal or offensive and people, the authorities, have the power to take it down within the country, uh, they just simply take it down. Uh, there are government to private actions. There's also private to private uh, relationships that will achieve the same thing. Uh, search results removals in the case of Google, Yahoo, and others where uh, websites are delisted. Uh, they're not exactly invisible, but they certainly are much harder to find if they are removed from them. Um, arrest intimidation is certainly a, a, a very compelling way to uh, limit access. There are indirect ways to do it, uh, denial of service attacks or hacking. Uh, re registration, licensing, and ID requirements are also going to chill free speech online. Uh, making ISPs liable for the content that is found is another way that it's going to drastically reduce the amount of information that's out there. S monitoring and surveillance is another one. If someone, if you have the perception that someone's looking over your shoulder, that's going to limit where you go and what you post greatly, whether that perception is true or not. Just to poke in on this, one of the key things we wanted to convey with our book and the study is there's technical internet filtering, which is a state stands between an individual and um, something they're trying to access. But there are a zillion other ways that this regulation, in fact, happens. It might be intellectual property law, or it might be a clamp down on the Diebold scenarios and things that Yokai covers in his book. Um, it's also often soft controls, things where individuals either self-censor or um, get others to censor. So um, I think it's very important as we talk about, okay, so there's a lot of filtering, technical filtering in the Middle East, to note also that lots of filtering is happening in lots of different ways, including in the United States, of course. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, this is a Egypt, where they've uh, sentenced a, a blogger to prison. There is no filtering in Egypt, but uh, they are certainly trying to limit what is shown there. The targets of internet filtering, I'm going to take you on a quick little tour of that. There's the usual suspects, which is uh, material that's harmful to minors, uh, IP rights, social, socially sensitive topics, pornography, gambling, drugs, alcohol, national security concerns are often cited for filtering political opposition, religion, and VoIP. To be clear on IP rights, it's not the rights that are blocked, but things that uh, people think are subject to their rights it's in which they infringements then upon the intellectual property rights. Thank you. Uh, Korea, by uh, most accounts, is the most connected place on Earth. Uh, you're not, however, from Korea, going to be able to read the propaganda that's emanating from the North. Uh, I stole this sequence from Ethan. Thank you, Ethan. This is a, uh, a prominent blogger from Bahrain uh, who is been blocked periodically in Bahrain. This is a, a brilliant mashup which shows the inequality of land distribution in Bahrain that was circulating on the internet at the same time that Google Earth was taken out for a few days there. I don't think that was a coincidence. Bahrain is an example of a small handful of countries where there's a list of blocked sites circulating out there. You can see here at the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, they have a list of 21 sites that are blocked. This is by far the exception. Just to pause on this, knowing you have a lot more slides to go on. Sure. Um, 
the point there is that in most cases, people don't know what's being filtered, right? So there are very few instances we found, basically none, where you can actually get a list. There have been lists floating around places like Thailand um, on the internet and so forth. It turns out those lists aren't particularly accurate, and we can show that. Um, but it's one of the key themes is how much transparency does a citizen have to know about how the filtering is happening and what's actually being filtered. Great. Wikipedia has been blocked in China. It's blocked in Burma. Reporters Without Borders is blocked in Tunisia and Iran and China, I believe. Human rights and political opposition is one of the key things that we're interested in, certainly. Human Rights Watch, a lot of the same suspects there, Tunisia, Iran, and others are blocking this. BBC News is blocked in China. This particular one has uh, a story about uh, the opposition leader in Zimbabwe being arrested. You can see this in Zimbabwe, however, where there was no filtering at all. That's again, it's a evidence of a completely different strategy, is you, uh, is you intimidate people and that the influence and the depth and the coverage of the internet is not the same in Zimbabwe as it is in China. And it hasn't uh, justified a filtering strategy there yet. It's not because we think that Robert Mugabe would uh, has is not filtering the the internet on some principle or something. Did you want to jump in, Ethan? This is sort of a, a place where some of global voices work, and O and I's work, and certainly Peter Sackler a little bit, which is that um, you can sort of throw up a, a Twitter account and say, "Hey, I'm going to be filtering the internet." And the you would expect at some point to see state-sponsored filtering because the offline environment is so restricted. Well, there's also a level of paranoia there that people are very careful what they do online in Zimbabwe because they have the perception that yeah. people are reading their emails and watching Just where the, they go. The soft controls point. Right. One of the key things we're highlighting in the book is this notion of anomalies also, which um, Ethan has one axiom, and then there are pushbacks against that axiom. Um, one might presume that there's a high correlation between those places that regulate media, for instance, um, offline traditional media and the internet, but there are also places like Russia, Algeria, and so forth, where we found next to no technical internet filtering where one might perceive that there would be. So both, I think, the places where we find it and where we don't um, is part of the interesting story. Uh, this is going back to China. There's a uh, Google search compare that you can find on the ONI site, which will show you. I'm sorry, my Chinese characters didn't come through when I captured this, but there's uh, Google.com. You'll, if you put in Tiananmen, you'll see tanks coming up first. In uh, Google.cn, the first uh, thing on the on the left is is a is a happier. Is much much happier. It's a, it's tours and promotion of going to the uh, Forbidden City. So. Very different there. Uh, moving on to Pakistan, there's a uh, an active independence mo movement in Balochistan that's blocked. Michelle Malkin is blocked there. Mm -hmm. Jihad Watch is blocked there. They also block Hindu unity, which is one of the things they share with India. India is an interesting case of a democracy grappling with free speech and internet blocking. They blocked this site and, of course, made it much more notorious in doing so. It's kind of a, a very fringe, kind of marginal site at, at best, which has probably seen a lot of, uh, a lot of traffic since the uh, Indian government decided to block it. This is, uh, Ethan, is this Sammy's work, the, the Tunisian yeah, this prison is, map? It's a... This is Sami from Garbia, who is now our advocacy director, is a longtime uh, Tunisian free speech advocate based in uh, The Hague. Yeah. This is a, uh, a Google mashup map showing the location of prisons and the attributes and prisoners held in these, these different things. This is, of course, blocked in Tunisia. Blocking of... Tunisians like to say they go to Algeria for the freedom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, th the things we've seen around the world is, is the blocking of, of bloggers. Uh, uh, Pakistan has taken out blogging servers, Ethiopia as well. Uh, again, this, this site is, is blocked in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is one of the most recent entrants into internet filtering and is focused primarily on political speech. In uh, Thailand, you won't find this page, which is uh, where you can buy a copy of the book, The King Never Smiles, on Amazon.com. 
if we have time at the end, we could talk about the uh, YouTube blocking of, uh, of the Thailand's blocking of YouTube. This is a, another quirky site, Arab Times. This is the one site that we found that elicited the ire of the uh, Jordanian um, ruling family in order to block it. This is blocked across the Gulf. It's a, a political parody site. Religion is blocked in, in many cases. Of course, uh, pornography and sexual uh, materials are blocked in many places. The Gulf countries uh, are the classic social filters out there. I was very impressed that Rob managed to find examples from both Playboy and Gay.com that were uh, workplace safe. We're laughing. Actually, the, finding a, a gay site was more difficult. But anyway, gay and lesbian content is uh, filtered in many countries around the world, as is uh, drugs and alcohol things. Gambling, too blocked in many countries around the world. The Gulf states block it much more comprehensively than countries such as uh, Korea and Thailand who have dabbled in that in the past as well. One of the trends that we also write about here is um, the notion of reverse filtering and the extent to which some people who are providing sites end up blocking access from other places, which is something that we're seeing anew in this set of research. So some examples of that would be gambling sites, but also um, some of the uh, dating sites. JDate does this, right, where yes. there's blockage of where people can access JDate from as opposed to some place that is trying to block their own citizens from seeing it. Another is the um, military sites. Some of the .mil sites in the United States can't be accessed from other places in the world because on our side we decide to block the access, which is a, obviously a twist on the, the basic story. The anonymizers are blocked in many places around the world. Stupidcentorship.com, you won't be able to find that in most places. There's a handful of countries that also uh, blocks the onion router tour. Boing Boing is blocked in a number of places. Tunisia is one, Iran is the other, and Boston is a third. <laughs> Not joking for anybody who hasn't Not been joking. reading the news. <laughs> Here's a site. It's the uh, URL. It's premaritalsex.info, and the header is sexual purity. This is blocked in many countries. It's actually a site which is uh, promoting abstinence. <laughs> but in these countries, the ban is so complete that we don't even want to talk about not having sex. <laughs> this leads into the notion of, of where these blocks are coming from and who's making the decisions. Uh, in the case of Bahrain, they have a list of 21 sites, Jordan 1, Singapore has a, a list of 100 symbolic pornography sites that are blocked. Thailand has a list that looks like it was put together by a bunch of guys in a room or who knows who it was. Uh, most countries, if you're going to comprehensively block the internet, have to rely upon software. And software, too, cannot do it by human means alone, there are automated ways of identifying what is offensive and what's not, and there's lots of mistakes made in doing so. And this could presumably be one of the mistakes there. Daily Motion, which is a, a YouTube alternative, was recently blocked in Tunisia. The reason it was blocked most likely is because the software company that made the classification of that site um, classified it as pornography and uh, took out the, the whole server with every single video on it. Internet filtering is uh, inherently flawed. There's lots of overblocking. The simplest way to block the internet is through IP blocking or DNS tampering. If you block an IP range, then you're going to be blocking all the sites that same that share that same IP address. I think it was the the case of Pakistan going after a blog there that ended up taking out tens of thousands of websites in doing so. Underblocking is also a problem. Uh, extirpating certain pieces of information from the internet is just about impossible and leads to the whack-a-mole analogy, which I love. We also have miscategorizations of the uh, software that leads the, to uh, filtering. Just to pause on the inherently flawed point, um, one of the things we're trying to get, of course, is how technically internet filtering happens, but also what are the choices that a policymaker has to make if they decide that they do want to do some kind of filtering? And one of the choices that we believe you have to make as the censor is, are you going to overblock or are you going to underblock? Um, and in the United States context, when we think about sort of First Amendment, um, overblocking isn't much of an option. Um, in other places, um, underblocking, you know, you may think about it differently in different policy contexts, and we want to try to set that um, into relief, but without stating it in a um, normative sense off the bat, but rather in a positive way, for starters. Exactly. That, uh, I think I'll just 
touch briefly on this. There are many different places where these controls could be enacted at the International Gateway. Most of the blocking that occurs around the world that is government mandated happens at the uh, ISP level by the internet service providers. There are of course institutions blocking for their own reasons and in many cases there are volunteer programs that are promoted by the government in which end user users install filtering software on their own computers. This is a brief overview of what we found. There's a cluster of about two dozen countries that block the internet. The take-home story in this, don't this yet. the take-home story in this is there are very few countries out of the total that focus solely on social filtering, Singapore being the uh, example of that, or security related, India, South Korea would be an examples of that. Once you put in the administrative and technical infrastructure for blocking the internet, you tend to block not only social but also political and conflict and security as well. How you interpret that, I think, is still open. To. Transparency is a is a huge uh, huge question in this. This is a blocking order that we got a copy of from India. Some people are very some countries are very explicit about the blocking that they carried out. Others aren't. I think there's um, two big elements to this. One is as a surfer, do you know you're being blocked when you're being blocked? And the other point is, when you are blocked, do you have any um, redress? Is there anyone you can complain to? And would you be willing to complain? What are the blocking criteria? Are they transparent? Is it part of an open public dialogue? Is there a review process? What's the policy on collateral blocking, which is the overblocking we spoke of a moment ago? And uh, how are you informed of, of being blocked? This is from Iran. You're very clearly being informed in this instance that you're not to go there. This is uh, from the United Arab Emirates. I'll read the, the text off of this. We apologize the site you are attempting to visit has been blocked due to its content being inconsistent with the religious, cultural, political, and moral values of the United Arab Emirates. That covers a lot of ground right there. I like it. You can click there to request that to be unblocked. What happens to you and which list you go on, I don't think, is readily apparent. Also, how you know that site you're looking for should not be blocked if you can't see it in the first place is a prob problematic piece of this as well. I'm sorry? I think that Saudi Arabia and, and UAE is actually fairly open to this, that if there's in these cases, they're using commercial software that does make mistakes, as we mentioned earlier. And if there's a clear mistake been made in the software, then I think they are probably open to unblocking that. It depends what the grounds are in which you're asking to have it unblocked, right? If you're trying to say it's, it doesn't fit the criteria, it's wrong, then I think you're much more likely, particularly in Saudi, to get unblocked. A better system would be to say, we're using smart filter if you think this is being improperly blocked right to them and they would probably get more we responses to that, that to yeah, sensors, exactly. Yeah. We should, we're at time, so we should... Okay, we're going to we're gonna wrap up right here. Uzbekistan, this is Korea, you get this block page which shows you the IP range as well. Uh, this is Tunisia spoofing a error page when which is in fact a block page. One of the issues we have of course is the profusion of technology around the world that's coming from um, the West mainly. There's a few emerging themes that have come from this. There's more concealed filtering. There's an increase in the number of countries filtering. There's many more considering it and doing so. There's event-based filtering, which I'm going to let John talk about in a moment. And there's an expanding global debate as well, which we think is good and healthy. We're also going to leave a few questions on the board for discussion. And uh, that's my piece. That sounds good. Um, so. Sorry, that, that was such a rapid-fire tour of a ton of data, but um, my sense is, given the time, that we should pause there and um, open it up for reactions. I'd love to prevail on Professor Bankler back there to be um, a respondent. He doesn't didn't know walking in the room that he was going to be, but um, we'd love to get some initial thoughts and then open, open it more broadly for questions. Well, I, I mean, first of all, I think this is enormously important work and admirable to actually have data on what's happening in so many places. Um, it's a little unfair uh, given that you're giving five years of work in 20 minutes, um, but I think one of the 
Is this necessary? I mean, it's not necessary, but it's a thing. But um, the mic's I, on the table are picking it up. Yeah, it's right? actually yeah. more needed for people in the back row than, than at the um, table. The table's fine. Because of the presentation, and this may be something you'll have to deal with with the introduction to the book or the or the formal rollout. So it's it, um, a lot of the richness that comes out of the detailed country studies gets lost in what here is presented as filtering is growing. It's all basically bad and uh, sensorial. Here are the countries. Um, I happen to have consumed two of your reports on Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, about five months ago in writing about communications in the Middle East. Um, and I have to say that the level of detail uh, that goes into the country descriptions um, suggests a different um, maybe focus of how to use the data um, and how to slice it in terms of trying to analyze how the countries are different. So, for example, um, uh, transparency. This was actually a good conversation right here. Um, how do you, as somebody who respects uh, democracy, uh, deal with the transparent process in Saudi Arabia, say, which happens to be something that from that study I went and actually looked at what they uh, uh, at the site and what they do. They say exactly what it is that they're doing. Uh, they talk about it in terms of uh, protecting a certain kind of cultural discourse. Uh, they make it available uh, uh, for people to add to and subtract from both government employees and people uh, calling in. As you say, they're fairly responsive. There's a category of question <coughs> of if what we're interested in is internet filtering and mapping that as opposed to having a single right sense of what free speech and democracy require, um, mapping these differences, what's bad, what's good, how much worse, would I think be very helpful. You, meant, you, you had the site of Blogger up there, but I think one of the things that's uh, interesting, if, and, and this is, as I said, I didn't prepare, so it's been five months since I looked at this material. But if I remember correctly, there's a huge difference between Iran and Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia only starts rolling out after they have the control mechanisms in place. That's exactly right. They and no, then they no self-consciously until... add blogging yeah. exactly later right. on, whereas yeah. Iran starts out with a freewheeling Internet that they don't really focus on and are jerry-rigging. So what are the differences there? The fact that, as I recall, at least from the last, only one major blogging hoster is blocked in Iran, but there are others that are live, both internal and external, and there's a very, very lively Farsi blogosphere. So I guess I'd be interested in hearing um, how you begin to map these rich and details and very different findings uh, onto a set of concerns that have to do with democracy, different cultural commitments to different cultural things that we agree or disagree with. If we're willing to say that between Europe and the United States, there's different perspectives of nudity and Nazism, inverted in some senses. Um, uh, if we have a transparent process in Saudi Arabia, where, where do our, where, what are our limits? Um, so, so how are you thinking in terms of um, giving people peers into the internal divisions and diversity, uh, as well as mapping it onto different types of political considerations? So goes without saying this is a good question and core to much of our thinking. I would have three reactions to it. We're doing, in essence, three things. I think when we say, what are we at core spending $3 million over four years to do? It's to collect the data. It is to make an empirical data set that enumerates the way in which internet filtering is occurring around the world with a methodology that we feel is sound and on which other people can then draw conclusions that we, you know, you write in page 266 of your book about it, right? The first ones we want, you know, Goldsmith and Wu write chapters and so forth. The idea being a data set on which other people can rely. The challenge in that context is how do we present it in a way that people can use it usefully? Um, and that's what we're sort of trying to do with both the, um, the website um, as it stands now. Uh, and um, 
the country studies as we roll them out, 40 you know, of them together. Um, one balancing question there is, do we really want to give an open API to all of the sites that are blocked around the world, um, to everybody, for instance, to the censors? Um, if you were one, the you know, 28th state to come online, would you want for us, would you, we, want for us to have um, the world's collected list of URLs out there for them to suck down and then choose from? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? We've got all of those questions going, um, but that's point one. And we're most comfortable talking about this in positive and not normative terms, that at least I am anyway, because um, I don't know the question, the answer to one of the questions we have up there um, on the previous slide is, is there such a thing as good internet filtering? Is it the case that some people actually get access to more internet because, if you think internet itself is good, because filtering could happen in that place on a limited basis and so forth? I think there are a lot of really complicated normative questions there. Um, answer number two is this question about um, how much should we write in the country studies? So um, our first strategy was write very long. We've written about 15 quite long, quite detailed um, studies, the Iran and Saudi ones, um, examples of this, which are roughly speaking 60 or 80 pages. They're meant to be very contextual. They're meant to bring in a lot of the political detail, um, how the technology works, the sort of topology of internet and so forth. It turns out that not that many people read those. Um, and they take a long time to do. We spent many years doing the first 15 or so of these reports. Um, and so, uh, We've shifted toward um, trying to create broader coverage, shorter reports, and then deep dive on some that have specifically interesting stories, um, and then hope that other people will build upon it, thinking of it sort of in wiki-like terms. Um, and then third is to do a book on it, which is the only way we thought that we could actually you need something of this kind of heft to try to set the context in place. And the way the, the book is written, um, uh, it's more or less to bet at this point, is um, a fair amount of data as straight as we can give it. Here's what we found. Here's where blocking occurs. Here are the types. We obviously have to superimpose some judgments there, but you know, look across the 40 countries. Um, and then it has a series of chapters that are contextual that Jonathan Zitrin and I wrote uh, a handful of them. Rob uh, wrote one. Um, someone wrote one on hacktivism, Ron Diebert and Rafal Rosinski. We have one on the technical thing. And it's supposed to, basically those are our takes on um, the context for it in which it belongs and the, the sort of richer stuff. And, I guess the, the short of it is we're trying to have it not just both ways, but all ways, that we're presenting a data set, um, some little bits of context, and then our take on the context. Um, but I'm certain we're not there yet in terms of doing it right. I don't know if you have a um, sort of best practices or a way to think about that. I found the case studies to be enormously valuable because, um, because they allow you to get a much richer sense of um, what the features might be, how filtering is or isn't playing a marginal role relative to other forms of intimidation mm -hmm. and constraint. Um, uh, and so to even be able to evaluate, is filtering important uh, at the margin right. in these relevant countries? Uh, having the depth and richness of the case studies uh, to me was more helpful than having the uh, um, aggregate data, <coughs> although the trend issue, the fact that you've got more countries right. uh, becoming, as it were, more sophisticated is actually, an, uh, uh, um, um, and I hadn't seen that obviously before, and that I think is is interesting. The other thing, the international flows, which you just ran across very quickly, yeah. I think need to be a very important American political debate where we supposedly are exporting free speech at the same time that we're exporting the core mechanisms for uh, the most effective filtering, particularly for countries that didn't build filter systems and all they need to do is jerry rig. Right, that's exactly right. And you know, one of the, the sort of sides projects here, it's central to a lot of other people, is the extent to which um, American and Western technology companies that are multinationals are getting involved in this process, getting sort of caught in the crosshairs of this process. Um, and one of the <laughs> other things Max and others have worked on is the um, development of a set of principles that we've been seeking to work with Google and Yahoo and uh, Microsoft and Vodafone on, sort of based upon our data. Um, right now, Colin McClay and uh, Jonathan Zischer are in London hashing out some of those principles. That's now a public process that we can talk about. Lots of good NGOs at the table and so forth. Um, but I think that's a really important story. In some cases, it's a search engine that has some deleted results. In the case of Google, in some cases, it's somebody offering an application like Microsoft that says you can't type democracy in the title of your blog post. In other cases, it's 
a U.S.-based company accused of turning over information about journalists who gets thrown in jail in the Yahoo case. In other cases, it's people who are actually providing the software, Smart Filter, um, a secure computing product, um, uh, and a variety of others that actually end up doing it. And sort of where on that continuum do you draw various ethical uh, moral lines and so forth? Well, one of the aspects of this which I find fascinating and, and puzzling is that the, the software wasn't only designed for repressive governments to block sites, it's also designed for parents to limit access to the internet for their children. And the strengths and limitations work just as well for the parent-child relationship as it does to the government citizen. And circumvention, similarly, the, the circumvention tools that are used by people to get around the restrictions of repressive governments are the same circumvention tools that 12-year-olds are going to be using yeah. to circumvent their parental controls. And, Which uh, is also a, I mean, a parallel argument is Cisco has been pulled into this net. that They've been accused right from the start of selling um, the uh, hardware that, in fact, China and others used to, um, as routers to carry this out. But Cisco's response is, look, we were required to put in these surveillance tools because of CALEA, the Communication Assistance to Law Enforcement Act, for so the U.S. FBI can listen in on this, and it's the exact same technology. So we end up seeing this kind of argument recycled. But, um, Ethan, uh, you probably have it as Yochai has to go, but you probably have a different view in terms of where we should spend our time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Yochai. Um, as an activist, um, as well as scholar and so forth, you've had a, uh, a different pushback to us, not so much write longer and more contextual reports, but rather um, be more nimble or something. Well, let, let, let me offer the hard version of the argument, then I'll look at the software yep. um, One of the things that's starting to happen around the world is that we're seeing blocks that aren't permanent, aren't perpetual, might just happen for a very short amount of time. And um, activists in these countries, and not just activists, but anyone who's trying to use the tools of free speech, find themselves really sort of desperate for confirmation that they are in fact being censored, and that they aren't in fact just dealing with a wonky corner of the internet. Um, maybe the best example of this would be Ethiopia, which has been extremely aggressive um, at censoring citizen media and blogs, where um, reporters including a reporter for Reuters who lives in Ethiopia, has called up Ethiopia Telecom and has said, are you blocking my blog? No one in Ethiopia can access it. And Ethiopia Telecom has said, no, 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 we're just really incompetent. Uh, we have a hard time keeping a network up. Uh, don't blame us. You know, we're just Ethiopians. Um, and he's been really desperate to get confirmation that, in fact, ETC, the Ethiopian Telecommunications Company, is blocking his and thousands of other blogs. It's been really tough to get rapid response out of ONI. Uh, it, let's be frank, it's been really tough to get you know mid-range response out of ONI. Uh, and this is a guy who's you know been willing to go and sort of run the tests and you know wants to get response on whether or not things are getting blocked. What we're seeing from activists are activists writing their own tools. Uh, and they're not as good as your tools. They're not as good as ONI tools, but they're out there, they're fast, and so you've got Astrobal in Tunisia running the 403 header checker, and you've got you know Great Firewall in China running a site that we all know doesn't work, but has gotten tremendous attention because people are really desperate to find out what's blocked and what's not. So I, I think what's interesting is that by trying to do some of the stuff that Yochai is pushing for and get the really bulletproof, contextualized, highly accurate stuff, <coughs> ONI has actually opened this sort of interest and this sort of marketplace for much less accurate tools. Um, and for people to sort of come in and say, well, I want to know now whether this site is being blocked or not. Maybe I'm not going to have as definitive an answer. Maybe I won't have the same sort of context and the same sort of care in reporting it that I would get out of an ONI report. But at least I'll know now so that I can start rallying people to overcome this block. Um, so I think that's the hard case. I think the soft case says maybe there's a solution to this where ONI does precisely what you were saying, JP, and just focuses on getting the data out there, and then maybe does some of the really detailed, high-level reporting on it on a longer scale, but also makes it possible for other researchers out there to sort of use it on a shorter-term scale. Well, what would, if you could um, describe what you think we ought to do in terms of empowering this kind of rapid response as we go forward, knowing that we're kind of 
now we have a solid baseline. We spent a lot of time and effort to get to this point. What would you want to see O and I able to do, and what kind of questions we'd want to answer? And just before you answer, uh -huh. I'll give you a second to think about it. I know you know the answer, but um, with the I don't know 20 minutes or so we have left, one of the things we'd love to get reactions to, obviously questions about the data is great too. But we're, we are going to roll this out in a formal sense about a month from now at Oxford. Everybody's most welcome if you happen to be at Oxford or want to be at Oxford on uh, May the 18th. Um, we'd love to get our, you know, what do you think are the most intriguing questions that we should be talking about based on these data? What are, what are the hard questions you're left with? Um, and that, that as we sort of continue the conversation, um, which we'll put up on the conference wiki, it would be great to, just as Charlie is doing right now for the IS2K7 conference about universities on May 31st, what are those intriguing questions about internet filtering to kind of push the conversation ahead? So r right now there's often an experience that activists have where they try to work with O&I and say, look, I think I'm being blocked in my country. Can you confirm? And the response is, we'd love to take a look. It's going to take a while. Uh, we could really use your help, help us run this tool. Um, and then activists go out, run the tool, do queries using dig, do queries, uh, the, the real dig, not the, the dig.com thing, um, uh, do trace routes, do all sorts of things to sort of try to document. And then the response frequently comes back from O&I is, guys, this is really complicated. Don't conclude that you're being blocked just based on that. One thing that would be great would be a guide. <laughs> How do I figure out whether I'm being blocked or not? You know, there are some pretty clear indications nowadays. There's a wonderful post on uh, Alech Abdel Fattah's site right now that gives pretty good evidence of DNS poisoning. And he's got a lovely little sort of one page, how do you figure out if DNS is being poisoned? It would be great for you guys to be able to sort of hand that information back to activists and say, okay, here's a much more complicated process, let's go through this in detail, and let's determine whether there is in fact a good deal of evidence that you're being blocked. So it's a combo of tools and handbook, basically. Take the knowledge that you guys have developed over five years and Pursue it not from the perspective of research scientists at Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, or Toronto, but pursue it from the perspective of an Ethiopian activist trying to figure out whether he's being blocked or not. How do you walk someone through answering that question over five or ten pages if need be, but answer it in some detail? Yeah, what did you guys learn in Nigeria? Um, it hasn't been QA'd yet. Um, uh, but I should, I will tell you offline when we're not in this whole, you know, recorded way because I don't want to say it and then have it be wrong. Um, okay. But the, the, the gist of Ethan's question is one of the things we've been trying to do is to try to make the, these data more context relevant, specific, immediate. Um, and uh, one way to do that is figuring out um, whether or not internet is being blocked during election cycles. Um, one of our goals is that a few years from now, the Carter Center or others, when they go OSCE, go to do election monitoring, they include internet um, filtering as one of the things that they do. Um, we've done it now three times, um, in Kyrgyzstan and Belarus, and now in Nigeria this past week. Um, as you may have read, that was a disaster of an election overall. Um, but the news wasn't bad, put it that way, in terms of the, the internet um, internet blockage. And we, and we think we've learned a lot in terms of being able to put tools in the hands of a GV researcher, in this case, um, to uh, to do that testing on the fly. David? Not filtering the prohibition on, right. on content. And uh, Rob and I have had some brief conversations about it, but I, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, data to be gathered and analysis to come from looking at, at these, because as these countries start to realize that people can circumvent some of the technological measures, that these other uh, changes in third-party liability, criminal libel law, um, can, can have a very uh, uh, a very pervasive effect throughout the country in accomplishing these objectives as well. And uh, I'd love to start combining our resources between the System of Law Project and ONI to start to, to look at these things more carefully. And maybe first thing is to start to collect the data and, and then start to draw some conclusions from it. done two joint missions with the Human Rights um, Clinic, one to Russia last year and one to um, Thailand, uh, another part of Southeast Asia, with clinical students to try to go and you know, put together the kind of lawyer's set of um, research tools and um, this, and we'd love to continue with the Social Media Law Project. 
Um, for the benefit of Seth, who is the scribe of these questions, can you put your statement into a question form? In other words, what is it that you would want to know or have discussed? Is there sort of a hard question buried there? How are countries using uh, their legal systems to effectuate these purposes apart from technological measures that you are identifying? Stephanie, can we call on you to give a brief reaction on this since it's something you've <coughs> done, I think, some of the best work on uh, uh, with China or otherwise? Was well, yeah, Rob had a handy like graph that was sort of indicating that the level of rule of law in any given country is not necessarily correlated to like low levels of filtering. So that's not really the factor that counts. And so part of this would be also, I mean, I had a sort of normative question too, because when you when you talk about overblocking and underblocking, what it would be like the appropriate amount of blocking, or in terms of like how would you define that normative standard? And if a country has laws that enable that or authorize that, does that make them valid in any way and does, does the inquiry stop there and so countries like Singapore <coughs> that have very sophisticated experience with defamation suits um, block maybe like a handful of sites and so that and Malaysia as well so there are a number of countries where they where they've used all these controls it'd be like criminal liability it'd be making ISPs responsible for storing information on users and also reporting any kinds of um, illegal activity um, and it goes at every single level of, of what you consider the internet and usage there. So uh, it'd be like licensing and uh, registration requirements as well. And so a lot of countries like even India, uh, where they only block maybe a dozen or a couple dozen sites um, that don't seem to have that much impact on the larger kind of flow of information, um, build in these uh, clauses into their like ISP licenses where they say, um, that are kind of what you consider maybe extra legal, but on a contractual basis. And so there's a lot to be done in terms of like weeding those out and trying to figure out how those things happen as well. I think Stephanie has done truly extraordinary work as we've written up this book in terms of trying to categorize these different kinds of controls and how a lot fits into it. Um, I should note also that we've gotten a lot of pushback as we've circulated these drafts of the book, um, particularly by from Jack Goldsmith on the faculty here, who's written a great book with Tim Wu, who controls the internet. Um, similar topic, and his pushback back basically is, um, be, bless you, be really careful in how you describe this story from the perspective of the United States and from the West, um, and also recognize that control of the internet is um, effectuated all the time, particularly um, uh, by places like us that have extensive rule of law, and though it might be normatively better, um, the space is highly regulated, um, and maybe even more so uh, in the U.S., and figuring how to there's sort of apples to oranges there in, in terms, some sense of trying to describe it, um, but to get um, to get it right in terms of not writing a finger wagging book um, about others, but also um, trying to draw some lines between um, technical filtering and other kinds of filtering um, has been a real challenge. Uh, along those same lines, one um, offsetted way of uh, filtering. Um, and also another kind of layer of corporate complicity in the whole thing is with financial institutions um, and how states can effectuate filtering through, you know, refusing, not allowing financial institutions to charge for certain sites. Can you give an example? Um, well, it's one way, even in the West, how you can effectuate your, a ban on internet gambling. Um, just tell the credit card companies they're not allowed to have a relationship with these websites. Uh, you didn't really cover that in this. I thought you mentioned it in your chapter, though. Yeah. How much does the book get into it? And perhaps that's even one way of um, achieving what Professor Goldsmith recommends. Yep, that's a really good point. Can you just also, for Seth benefit, reframe that in the form of a question? Yes. Is covering the uh, financial institution's complicity in filtering one way of achieving the two-way criticism that Professor Goldsmith recommends? Others of questions that come out of this or, or reactions or whatever. Now, because if we take the make this. Um, my question is, besides like uh, filtering and doing other research, uh, what kind of thing is the INO doing to help the blogger or um, or the website, you know, holder, like some tip, so the filter won't won't catch them. 
because like I last week I saw in BBC they were giving some tip how to you know write some more differently yeah. so that the filter won't cut you. So what kind of thing are? It's an excellent question. So I take your question at core to be what are we doing to help those who are blocked or perhaps those who are subject to surveillance be less blocked or less subject to surveillance, presuming that we think generally it's a bad thing that there's blocking and surveillance going on. Um, we've made a decision that may be the wrong decision, but here at the Berkman Center, that that's, that's not our business. That we're not, um, we're not in the sort of consulting um, frame, uh, nor in sort of going as far as advocating against um, these kinds of uh, things, at least yet, that our first goal is to describe what's going on and try to put it in the context of the stuff that we know. Um, that said, we're sensitive to it um, and think it's important that somebody do it because many of us personally believe that um, people should be able to speak more freely and take advantage of the opportunities of the internet and do so without being subject to surveillance. It turns out that some of our partners in the Open Initiative do a lot more of this than we do. The Citizen Lab, for instance, at the University of Toronto has built a tool called Siphon, which is uh, one of these tools that allows you to circumvent the filters. Um, we're quite interested in studying those and trying to give advice on which of these work better than others. Um, but I also think it's to be a variant of Ethan's question, which is, um, while this is plainly relevant research to scholars of Yokai Benkler's caliber, um, it is not always relevant research, or as relevant as it might be, to people who are um, on the ground. And, and they could be active political activists, they could be hacktivists, um, but how can we kind of bridge that? And I take that to be, you know, a good and valid, good and valid criticism. And, you know, it's one that we struggle with always with this project. Um, um, from from what the ONI is doing, it's it, um, not to call, classify it as top down, but it really is like a localized group of people. And, uh, and Ethan, I think the, the gist of your question is how to get you know, some of those efforts out to the people who are directly affected by them, yep. uh, and to get them involved in doing. Yeah, testing. but that still leaves out the vast swath of the population who is neither at the Bergman Center nor, you know, blogging in Nigeria. And I was wondering if if you guys are looking into tools. Uh, network computing, anything that would get the average user, you know, to to take part in checking on internet filtering worldwide. Definitely. So the last two bullets of our um, thing up here, and we should obviously capture these effectively, to go to that question, which is, um, you think about sort of con concentric circles, right? There's the paid researchers of the Berkman Center and our partners in the ONI. Um, there's a group outside of that that are who are volunteer activists who do uh, some of the testing for us. There's another ring that's sort of Ethan's ring, I would call it, which is sort of um, internet activist types, bloggers, and so forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, rings in the consent center circles. And, um, technically able, likely, to be able to do these things and so forth. The, the next ring out is really, um, you know, a, a broader group of people who have enough of an interest in this but aren't technically savvy nor paid and so forth. Um, we have real designs for this crowd. Um, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, but I'll, I'll throw, you, throw out two things that we're doing. One is, as we redo the website, and we can show that again if you like, is to have it try to make it more interactive so that there are ways that you can suggest sites that we will then test. Um, we want to get more tools out to more people in, in, in Ethan's way so that people can actually um, take the tools that our researchers use and run them and then get data back into a set that we can then QA. Um, but the sort of throwing the long ball version of this is, is Jonathan Citron's obsession, which is um, to do a distributed application. Um, and the idea is sort of like SETI at home, for those who know that project it was. You could run a bit of code on your computer that would allow you to participate in um, a distributed research project or using some spare cycles. Um, and so we've started the design on this. We've started the design on this in a way that's um, uh, in line also with the Stop Badware project, which could have use of a distributed application. Um, there are people also who want to do the same thing for net neutrality, to have the same kind of application test for network blockages um, uh, and changes in quality of service and so forth in terms of how packets go for it. So we are totally, totally interested in doing this, but it is early, early days. A, a respectful pushback on setting at home, <laughs> right? You can run setting at home on your machine, but it doesn't sort of flash on your screen and say, you've just found alien intelligence, right? I mean, yeah. that, that processing job is left to SETI because it's it's hard work, it's heavy lifting, yep. you know, figuring out that, that this is not radio noise, but this is in fact someone sending it to Fibonacci sequence is, yep. is, is not an easy thing to do. Um, this model seems to go sort of in the same direction, which is to say, you can help us out by running this client on your machine, you know, on a particular ISP in a potentially blocked nation. But under current models, you know, we might let you know some months to come whether you're coming up with convincing data 
that's so showing us that things are pushing back in the other direction. The designs of the application are to do it in a way that gives some instant feedback. Great. Um, both for stop adware to basically say on your PC, you know, what's going on right now? Could you just check in and see is something going wackily wrong? Like too many queries over here, and Great. that might map to this. Likewise with filtering to give you some sense of that. Likewise with um, net neutrality, are your packets going more slowly through? Of certain set of certain types. That would be great because we we've not done that very well. So we've not done that. We've done that period. Max, do you have follow up? Oh yeah, uh, the on? the GIMP, the Great Internet Mercy Prime Search, actually does alert you if you found something. So I guess the technology is there. Technology is there. The, that's hours in the day. It's more more the issue. Right, um, as you mentioned earlier, there are quite a few American high tech companies which provide uh, filtering technologies to. Um, countries. So um, I think in the areas of company law, people talk about the idea of uh, corporate social responsibilities. And people have been talking about this topic for decades. Um, so company are required to, uh, are required to um, provide um, um, services or products which has um, enough quality to protect consumer welfare or security. Companies should not um, uh, carry out uh, uh, environmental pollution activities. So I wonder whether the RMI reports deal with um, the issue about um, corporate social respons responsibilities. Um, if so, does the re report uh, kind of provide a definition of the social responsibility, responsibility that should be imposed on high-tech companies, or to what extent such kind of social responsibility should be imposed on the companies? Um, the ONI reports per se do not, but one of the chapters in the book does. Um, Jonathan Zitcher and I have a chapter called Reluctant Gatekeepers, which is exactly on this topic. I'd be happy to send you the draft of it. Um, as I mentioned before, we've been involved for 18 months or so in a process, once confidential, now, now public, um, where a bunch of NGOs, um, as well as companies, are getting together to figure out what does corporate social responsibility mean in this area. There are at the table a bunch of institutional investors, for instance, which is sort of interesting in that way. A bunch of people have done CSR in other contexts. Um, and uh, literally at this moment, when I mentioned that people are in London drafting this, is probably a little late in the day, but have for the last two days been updating this set of principles for what it what it means for these companies to um, uh, be acting in a, in a in something appropriate manner. And yes, we're superimposing to some extent in our writings what we think that responsibility is. And it's you know there's sort of a negotiation to say is there a possible way to make that into something like the Sullivan principles were um, in the apartheid context in South Africa. Have you said who those companies are? Just, I'm sorry? <coughs> have you said who those companies are that Google, are meeting? Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and Vodafone were the first four who are publicly out about it. I think there are a couple more that will be will be or have been added, but I don't know how if that's public or not. Right. So I will not say it on the webcast. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, we can get back to something that you mentioned really briefly, which is how you release the the specific data, say if I run a website and I want to know where I'm blocked around the world, um, there have to be a lot of nuances about releasing that data, but it's obviously data that so many people would love to have. So I'm not sure I have a well-formed question, but what are some of the ways that that can be done? Or So here's one. We have a little application that's been developed. And what's the website you'd be interested in? Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> I think Rob is interested in Playboy. Um, no, I just know we're going to get good results. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're interested from that previous slide. Um, so, so we're messing with this, and I'd love I'd love your input on it. One one easy way to do it is, is just, the URL for that available. It's yeah, it's, no, it's not, right? okay. it's not available. Okay, it's not available. It will be someday. Um, not, basically, not we we have. Do you control plus on that? Okay. You make it bigger. The size of the. Um, so as we've been redoing the website, um, we've been trying to think about how, how do we do this in a way that allows individuals to get data that they ought to have access to, and it makes it at least a little bit hard for the sensor, wherever she may be, out there in the world to get all of it all at once, and then be able to use that block list in um, 
the censorship tool. Now, maybe we shouldn't worry about this. Maybe you guys will say, whatever, you know, it's just not that big a deal. Someone will get the block list. Um, but uh, we're struggling with it. But I, I could, I guess I could see a situation where some country decides they want to, they want to filter, but they don't want to go to all, all the time. We're just going to use China's. We're just going to use whatever whatever China says isn't good. We're going to say isn't good too. Right. The way that you you block uh, right. We're email addresses we're kind of like China, right? Yeah. Well, one trend that uh, appeared in a lot of countries, including like China and Iran, which are some of the worst block filters, oh. is that it's very country specific content. So it's in the lo local language, um, and it's relating to like like human rights issues or political opposition in those countries themselves. So. The blocking from the globalists in those countries is, is a lot less extensive than those countries where you see a lot of social filtering based on pornography and those kinds of things. So it would be a little bit difficult for somebody to just take lists from some of the worst filters, like Vietnam, China. It's a it's a great question. Can you can you formulate it into something Seth can use to? Uh, what kinds of methods or tools can we develop that will allow this data to be released in a way that individuals who need the data can use it, but that it doesn't assist filtering practices by governments. My, my other concern with this is, is also we don't want ONI to be a clearinghouse for pornography and weird stuff on the net. We don't want to be the go-to place for, for teenagers to yeah, find something stuff weird, that, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm just saying this. It's a question. Oh, well, I'm thinking about, I guess I'm thinking about the story of filtering like over a timeline. And so you've been collecting data for five years. I'm wondering if that tells any story about about the kinds of fil like the kinds of filtering that you saw in year one versus year five, and then how future data might tell a story about what are you know how with the release of this data set, how will filtering change? Maybe in response to your data, but maybe just because of new things that you're starting to catch. So a bunch of questions in there. Um, the one is sort of the Heisenbergian question of, you know, are we are we messing with the environments? And we probably are. But um, in terms of comparing the 2002 data to the 2007 data, it's not, um, we can't do that much of it, to be truthful. Um, it hasn't been collected in a stable enough way to allow longitudinal um, consideration. Saudi, we've tested probably, I guess, four years know, in that period. So we've got a couple of states where we can do a pretty good um, job of it. But it really is about starting here and for the next four years. We have a team together. We have funding and so forth. So uh, the real question is, um, what do we want to know over time that we can use this um, kind of baseline uh, uh, as the starting point from? It's a terrible formulation, but you get the point, right? We have a baseline. What do we want to know going forward in a longitudinal sense? Um, do you have any guesses as to that or, or hypotheses? I just, well, in your Venn diagram, I just wonder if there's going to be more moving toward the center, or if some countries, if there's kind of two stories, maybe some that never filter and start filtering, or some start filtering but maybe move toward democratization, or, um, or maybe there's a third story I'm not thinking of, but, yeah. but how in that diagram countries start moving around? It's a great question. One of the things that Charlie Nesson also suggested as the one of the themes of the book is what does the slope of the freedom curve look like in a given place? That it's not so relevant that today somebody filters, but are they getting more or less free as a, or open as an information environment? We, we've, we've set up a framework such that in future years when we test, it'll be easier to track over time how these changes are occurring. So we're considering that. We, we do have to recognize that there are limitations in how we assess filtering and what the impact is. The filtering of one website to another can have very, very different implications. The content of them can be very different. And the, I don't have a good analogy for it, but it would be like trying to compare the value of the information in one library versus another. I mean, there's, there's such complexity and richness there that it's very difficult to condense it into these metrics. But, <coughs> Tracy? Um, so you mentioned that there are countries looking to join the club um, of filters. How do you know who they are? Are they public about it, saying, yeah, there we're looking to filter? There's debate and legislation in many places around the world. In Latin America, there's half a dozen countries uh, debating legislation. There's 
uh, even the countries that filter their our proposals being put forward all the time to increase the level of filtering. The United States is certainly one of the prime examples there, as well as Australia. There's a bill floated in Norway, which is breathtaking in its breadth. It's, uh, there's, so there's many examples. And is this filtering all legal, where it's happening now? But so That's the interesting question on the flip side of it, which is the vast majority of these systems are not prescribed by law. So it's hard to say that they're illegal, but they're not necessarily <coughs> described in the law in any way that one could then say this is it being carried out. Um, almost nowhere. I mean, I don't know of a filtering specific law that says this is exactly how we do it and here are the contours of it and here are the ways that you can push back on it and so forth. Um, so it's quite interesting on both sides of that, which is maybe what happens is there's a backfill of legislation for those places that do. I suspect that's unlikely. But for the ones going forward, is there such a thing as a good, legitimate internet filtering process where you pass it through legislation, you then have, you know, a, a appeals process and so forth, you could undo it and well, is, are, is this legislation content restrictions, like they authorize, you know, they make something pornography illegal, or are they specific to filtering? There's both. Okay. There's both out there. There's both out there. As, as, as Stephanie's alluding to, you can often use existing law to justify filtering so that something is illegal less than your draft. Well, one of the other interesting things that we, that we see very briefly, which we'll look at in the, in the future, is that there's kind of two regimes to, to categorize things very roughly. One is where someone within the government has the administrative capacity and power to just institute filtering. And in that case, as you, we see a lot of filtering. In those places where they debate it and there's executive, legislative, and judicial involvement in it, the answer is usually some filtering, but not as much. And then there's other places where they just don't do anything. And my feeling is they probably just haven't gotten around to it yet. I don't know if that's true. Or not. We should let people go, but um, your, one last question. Thank you. Um, Ethan, last word. Should you guys be helping people filter better? So it, 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 here's a question. I, I mean, um, Thailand blocks YouTube, right? And And I think everyone understands that Thailand isn't trying to block all of YouTube. They're trying to block a particularly offensive video. Right. Um, you guys could probably help them out and, and could probably say, uh, guys, you could be doing this much more responsibly. Here's a way to do this uh, blocking via URL or blocking via keyword rather than blocking via IP. Is that a direction that O&I should be working on? <laughs> Great question. It's sort of our third to last bullet up there, which is, you know, if we could think of filtering best practices, should we publish them? I, I'm and suggesting and going even further. Does it make sense for you to, to literally to be to, yep. the, to the censor? You know, I don't. We should put this on our list of questions for uh, future consideration. Too hard um, now to answer. But I, I did have the, to me, the most remarkable experience I've had in um, doing this work uh, a few weeks ago I was invited by the uh, uh, U.S. State Department to appear in the embassy of uh, the U.S. Embassy in Thailand on a video conference from 9 p.m. to 9, uh, 11 p.m. here and, and there in the morning. Um, and sitting in the room on the panel, which I didn't realize, was the censor, the woman who is in charge of censorship in Thailand. And I had a two-hour conversation with the censor in Thailand. It was wonderful, completely interesting. And she was quite upfront about what they're doing and so forth. Um, so I actually see more in our future of having conversations with her and you know the people who are actually doing it. You know, it's human beings who are trying to figure out how to do this and who believe it's appropriate. and. Um, you know, as we try to get more policy relevant, we should be in that conversation one way or the other. How we comport ourselves and what we say and how far we go down the consulting road is a different matter. But, but I think we should be, I think we should be serious about this and open about it. So. so you're open to consulting to the censors, but not to the people who are being blocked? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to point out that the question is remarkably close to the Google question, which is, it's Your exactly favorite. the Google question, yes. but uh, by the way, I love Bracey's question. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. the truth of the matter is, of course, as you know, we consult to the people all the time in this context. We do a lot of sharing of best practices in that context, but we don't talk about it that, all that you know, broadly in this kind of answer. So we, we do, I think we do our share on that. Uh, on that um, thank you guys very much for a great lunch. Thank you all. Okay.